Well, good day to you, friends and listeners. We've got a guest in the house. Well, on the phone talking with us today, Chairman Christy Craddock of the Texas Railroad Commission. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm very excited to finally get to talk with you. Why don't we go ahead and start with letting people know who you are and what it is that you do. So I am the chairman of the Railroad Commission right now, and the Railroad Commission is based in Texas. It doesn't do railroads anymore, though. We are the oil and gas regulator, in fact, the oldest oil and gas regulator in the entire country and in the entire world. We always say OPEC is based on us as far as their price controls and other things they do. And so I've been at the commission starting my ninth year. There are three of us elected statewide in Texas as commissioners. And I'm now the longest serving, I wouldn't say oldest, but the longest serving member on the commission as we are, as we're brought up it right now. And I'm the chairman, the chairmanship rotates amongst the three of us. And this is my third time to be chairman and uh, I'm happy to do so. I think we've got one of the best agencies in the entire state and frankly, probably one of the best agencies in the entire country when you talk about oil and gas regulations. So thought for just a second I'd tell you because we do have a funny name and it's a historical name always tell people in Texas nobody knows who we are but most everybody else in the country and in the world does and so we are the oil and gas regulator but we do pipelines and pipeline safety inspections for the state of Texas we have roughly 470,000 miles of interstate and intrastate pipe and pipelines in Texas and roughly another 500,000 miles of gas utilities uh, lines wow. in Texas. So we have a lot of, and gathering lines are in that 470,000 miles as well. So we have a lot of pipe in Texas. We're the largest pipe state by a sixth. It's an important part of what goes on in the state and safety is is really important, obviously, to all of us. Uh, we do gas utilities, like I said, and gas utility rates and safety in, in Texas. We also do coal and coal mines. People forget we do have coal mines. We're lignite mines, and I always say we're not the West Virginia dig down and deep in the ground, but they're strip mines in Texas. So that is an important part of our economy as well as our electricity grid in any given day in Texas is roughly 30% is coal based today. And we also have the other couple of quirky things that people don't realize that we do in Texas. We do have some geothermal. We're the geothermal world in Texas permitting and haven't done one in a few years, but we've had several companies looking for looking at that opportunity, particularly in South Texas. We also have uranium mines in Texas and South Texas. And so we have new exploration that comes through the Railroad Commission. And the last thing that's on, I think, everybody's conversation bucket right now has to do with carbon. And we are in carbon capture. We have had carbon capture rules in our world in Texas. And we're one of the first states to have them, period, since 2003. So we are ready already do carbon capture in Texas and are using it in our oil fields uh, for EOR enhanced oil recovery. Um, so we, and we've been doing that since 2003, I think we're the first state to have done that. And those rules go through the Royal Commission as well. So all of that being said, our biggest piece really does have to do with oil and gas and the oil and gas permitting. And we're the biggest state. We like being the biggest and we hope we continue being the biggest state for both production, rig count, um, about a third of the country's oil and the fourth of the country's natural gas right now and production-wise is coming out of Texas. So we have a big job in the state, and we are happy to have good rules and regulations in place for that. Wow, that is a, a, a so much really great information. First of all, um, is it, just, just for my own personal clarification, uh, the, the chairman, chair people, Chair, anyway, for your position. Chairman. We just say chairman. That's right. Um, Man or woman, we just call it a chairman. It's just easier. All right. So but you're elected by the people, right, for a term of six years. So if you're in your ninth year, you, you, this, you, you would have uh, won two terms then. So that's, first that's of all, con- congratulations. That's kind of. That's kind of a neat, just something kind of a side note there. But um, when you were talking about the carbon capturing and carbon emissions, it kind of 
triggered in my brain, too, a lot on the website that I'd seen regarding environmentally friendly practices or even like as you were mentioning, the strip mining and whatnot. Once those are done, I had seen uh, also on the website talking about ways to kind of bring it back into nature. How How is it that that uh, the Railroad Commission goes about uh, maintaining the environmental factor? Look, we think our two reasons that in our our the reason we do our job first and foremost is to prevent waste. So that was one of the reasons we started regulating oil and gas back 101 years ago, right in Texas, as it was discovered and protect the environment. Those are our two priorities at our agency. And so when we talk about protecting the environment, one of the things that we have and have had for years and years and have some of the Some of the oldest ones and the best practices, we believe, are rules and regulations, right? And we think they're one common sense rules and regulations. We try not to overregulate. We try to work with companies and industry, but we also make sure you follow our rules and regulations. To that end, we have inspectors. So we have roughly on the oil and gas side about 150 give or take inspectors just for the oil and gas division. We have another about 30 people who are on our division for coal and coal mines, and then about 70 people in our pipeline division. So uh, almost half of our agency, a good third to half of our agency is inspectors that are out in the field every day doing inspections. Last year, we did over almost 200,000 inspections in the state, across the state. And so it's a lot. We have a lot that we do in the state. We're a big piece of the state, and it's a big state. And so we have inspectors and and now 10 field offices across the state. And so our goal is, one, to make sure you're following the rules. And we try to have best practices and are real transparent as much as, as much as we can with our old technology, I'll get into that in a minute, but um, with what our rules and regulations are and when you're applying, when you're looking at things, we have a pretty vibrant website that we're continuing to improve. But and we want you to have the opportunity to be in compliance, right? So we go out, we do an inspection, you've got, you've got a violation, we want to give you an opportunity to, to fix that violation. If you don't, we are then going to come back and fine you, send you to enforcement. And every month we collect between 500,000 to a million dollars in penalties a month. Um, And if you don't follow our rules as an oil and gas operator, you could have drilled a $5 million horizontal well. And if you aren't compliance, we'll shut you down. And that's a lot of money that you are, that you could have, put into uh, under, into the ground and then not be able to produce. And we do that sometimes 15 to 20 times a year. We will shut people down until they come in compliance and take their operating license away. So we take it very seriously. It's part of the reason we, we are around as an agency. That being said, we also want to work with industry. That's the philosophy we have in Texas. We think industry has a lot of smart ideas, a lot of innovation, and generally are good operators across the state and want to do the right thing. So it's a good balancing act, I think, in, in Texas of how we how we regulate in the state. Nice. Sounds like you have a, a pretty well-balanced system kind of put in place. Um, I guess before there was COVID, there was a lot of stuff going on when it came to climate activism and uh, the ESG. Is that how how did that affect Texas? I guess that would have been toward the beginning of last year, the end of 2019, right? So we've seen the climate activism, I think, has been going on. Really, I was sitting in the seat during the Obama administration. We've had it an interesting administration during the Trump administration who better appreciated that states ought to be regulating instead of coming from the federal government. And now we're seeing a new administration go in this week. And I think we're going to see back to where we were with the Obama world. So we are prepared and looking at that. Uh, But I think what we found as an agency, frankly, and working with industry, people again are trying to do the right thing. But if you read the news, obviously you seen that Texas has some challenges with flaring. If you look at Texas, and I say it's our friends in New Mexico and North Dakota, we've had a lot of production pretty quickly, specifically in two fields in Texas. And so 
flaring and getting that infrastructure built so we don't flare has been and will continue to be in the short term a challenge for us. One of the things that we've been doing as an agency are a couple things. One, we've improved some data sheets and some and to get more information. We are, uh, I keep alluding to our technology, we are on a mainframe with Fortran for a lot of our data. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it, we've had it for about 40 years. So we're in the process of upgrading that those systems because we want to be more transparent and what we found is as, as we've upgraded our data and our information um, in our data collection we're also more efficient as an agency so that has been one of our priorities is to continue to gather better data work with our sister agency texas commission on environmental quality that does a lot of uh, does all of our air emission uh, work in this state so we're all on a page so we can make sure we're presenting good data and we have good information. But look, flaring is a priority to figure out how we do it better and do a lot less of it in the state. We've talked about it a lot for the last 18 months in Texas. I don't think anybody has the magic answer to it, but we've seen industry first and foremost step up and start changing what they're doing. And we're glad about that and being better in compliance for where we are in rules and, and realizing that that should be a priority for them as well. And uh, I think you'll continue to see that conversation develop and evolve. I know industry's got some work groups as well. And again, it goes back to that balancing act for us. We have all most of the large operators in the country have a, some position in Texas, but our lifeblood historically has been smaller operators as well. And so we don't want to have too onerous rules that small operators don't have an opportunity to get to be in compliance and continue to operate where the larger operators obviously can put a lot more money to it. And it's a, a huge priority for them as well. So how we continue to work with companies recognizing that we need to have best practices in this state because people look at us is, is a real challenge for us is, and we continue to work through that. Absolutely. That that does sound like a, a challenge of its own. Um, so it was alluded to me that something almost happened earlier this year, and I'm not entirely certain what, but it sounded kind of ominous. Was there something going on toward the beginning, middle of the year that uh, that wasn't so good? <laughs> So, sorry, you're talking about proration, I think, for, for us in Texas. Maybe. Um, I'm I'm not entirely certain. It was it was alluded that something had gone on and I'm I couldn't quite figure it out in looking at the at the sites and the information in front of me. I thought maybe So so Texas you know, if you go back to where we were a year ago in the country, right? We were all kind of rocking along knowing COVID may be out there and it really hit Texas at about, I call it spring break because I happen to be on spring break with my daughter. And so uh, mid-March for Texas, we uh, realized COVID was going to be a bigger challenge in this in this state than anybody had hoped and obviously are in the country and now around the world. And so we had been producing in this state 4.2 4 million barrels of oil a day, plus another almost would get us almost to 5 million barrels a day. If you looked at our, our liquids, um, we were at all time highs in 2019 and we were watching industry slightly reset in the fact that, um, that there was a lot of production going on. They were trying to make sure they could sell it on the worldwide market. And so two things happened simultaneously in the oil and gas industry. If you go back about 10 months ago, one, OPEC got to do their own fight, Saudi Arabia and Russia. And the second thing that happened was COVID. And so between those two, obviously the price of oil starts dropping and we see a lot more challenges in the state. And at that point, again, go back to mid-March last year, we had a couple of companies file an a, a application for us to look at uh, prorationing in the state again. So let me give you a little background on prorationing. When I said we were what OPEC is based on, if you think about OPEC, they tell their membership how much they can produce. Now, they don't ever 
keep to it. That's another problem. But how much they can produce a month and sell. So, right, that's kind of the basics of OPEC. So, okay. um, and and that's what Texas, as the Lord, at the time, the largest operator in the country and, frankly, in the world, up through the early 1970s, we had our individual operators come in monthly and we would say, you can produce this much out of that well or out of that field or, or, and it kind of varied, but basically you can produce that much. And we, we would tell you how much each well could produce. And so we had done, we did that for years and it started way back in the thirties when all the way through the forties, when Texas was sending over about 25% of our oil went overseas during World War II to um, help our, our our allies during that time period. And we did it up through 1973. And then obviously you had other states come on, start having higher production like our friends to the north in Oklahoma and New Mexico and other states start really having a lot of oil and gas production. And as you get into the 1970s, you now have Saudi Arabia and some of those countries come online as well. And so we at that point said, you can produce as much as you want. And I, that's where most state, I think every state is in the country, the free market took over. So we, as we are watching the price of oil go down, the demand in the country and in the world drop from 100 million barrels a day to roughly 80 million barrels a day. Then again, there was this application for us to look and figure out if we should be doing proration again. And uh, which right at the same time, we're shutting down for COVID and right at the same time, the entire country is trying to figure out what we're going to do and we're all stuck at home. We had two months of a very active conversation with a lot of information come in from all sectors of the oil and gas industry, whether you were a, a operator, a pipeline company, or you were somebody who was selling it on the open market. Uh, a lot of people give us information and we had an 11 hour hearing zoom hearing probably was the largest hearing at that point. Now we're all used to zoom, but that was a new technology for a lot of us back in April. And so um, now we're all used to it, but that, that was, and, and we had people from all over the world, literally watching to see what we were going to do as an, as an agency at that point with, you know, we had again, 5 million barrels of oil and a hundred million barrel a day market was not a lot, but it was a lot. If you put all of the United States together, it was more like 11 million barrels total. And our friends in Canada were watching to see what we were doing. Our friends in Mexico were watching to see what we were doing. So uh, we had this hearing. We appreciated it. We took a lot of information. I took 15 pages of notes in 11 hours. Oh, wow. And for those of you who were watching or paying attention, I got up total of 30 minutes in that 11 hours. That's the only breaks we took. Y'all got to wander around. We sat and took notes and we're serious about it because it was a serious conversation and it wasn't just big guys against small. It was a very split conversation of people that I would not have thought were on one side or the other. And we appreciated the data and about a week after about within two weeks after we had the conversation, the price of oil went to a negative 37. And so at that within a week, actually. And wow. so at that point, I think there was a recognition that this, which had never happened to, obviously before in my lifetime, in a lifetime, and I'd like to see it never happen again, by the way. But I think at that point, there was recognition from this agency that the free market really was going to work. And so we chose not to do proration in this, from this agency. And I think had we, that other states would have followed suit, right? Because um, like I said, we had a lot of people at 29,000 people watch our hearing from every state in the union, but Hawaii. So maybe I need to all go, we all need to go to Hawaii for a break or something. And, um, and South Korea was our second largest country that watched us. I don't know what goes on in South Korea, but apparently there's some opportunity. They're watching the oil and gas markets in Texas. So, um, it, it was interesting. We aren't sure why, but we had, you know, countries all over and, I think there, what we would have done, the rest of the country would have followed suit. But again, I think the philosophy overall at the agency is free markets work. And, and as we got to May, you know, we're now seeing that that's a, a true statement overall. And so uh, we're, 
we're glad we made the right decision. We felt like we were at the time, but you know, there was a lot of moving parts in a really quick, short time period. And I had somebody asked me last week, how would you have done it? Because to be really honest, we had not proration since 1973. The people who were at the agency and were in the industry in Texas during that time were either older and retired or dead. And I don't mean that in a mean way. It's just been a long time since we've mm-hmm. done it. So we would have probably done it by field. And that would have been really challenging for us um, and really challenging, I think, for the industry. So uh, we are glad we're past that conversation today and instead have tried to use other rules and waivers that we've been allowed to um, look at as an agency to try to keep this industry alive during the short period, meaning giving them more opportunity to file things, giving them more opportunity to um, waive some fees so they could put their resources other places and um, and keep people employed today. Oh, yeah. Every little bit helps, as I'm sure it you does. Do. Yeah. <laughs> It well, and, and then especially, as you had mentioned earlier, with the uncertainty of, of some things kind of going on in the current situation for our country, things that could potentially be changing. Do you think that there's any possibility that that conversation might come back to the table again, depending on what might go on in the next couple of months? You know, I don't think proration conversation will come back where I do think we have some real challenges with where we go forward as an industry and frankly as a country is you know we we in texas i start out by saying we believe in common sense rules and regulations and that makes this industry very vibrant in texas it's 30 to it's about a third of our state's economy is based in directly and indirectly in oil and gas and that's a lot for one state, but it's true for a lot of states across the country that they're getting a percentage of their dollar of their state income and fe- frankly, federal income from um, oil and gas and energy. And so I think as you're watching the Biden administration walk in the door in their stated philosophy about carbon neutral, getting back in the Paris Accord, um, potentially shutting down the Keystone XL pipeline, which, by the way, we've been open our part for business and permitted in Texas since, you know, I think 2008, nine. you know, we, we, right. it's been open on our uh, open on the southern for, end. For and years. I think doing business, yeah, right. And doing business with our friends in Canada to me makes a lot more sense than having to go continue to get heavy oil from Venezuela, or which we can't now, or Saudi Arabia or other countries. So, um, you know, I think that those conversations that allowing the states to do what the states do best versus the federal government telling us all what to do and choosing an energy source is not a, is a real difference of philosophy and hopefully the conversation doesn't get as stilted as it did during the Obama administration but I'm not hopeful today and look Texas is one of those states I told you third of our state's economy is oil and gas but we have energy sources of everything so we have nuclear oil natural gas we're the largest solar state in the entire country so we believe and we no solar and when between those two were the largest alternative energy state in the entire country. So we believe in all of it and it works well. Um, picking one, we think the Texas model works a lot better than the California model. We don't have rolling brownouts. We don't tell you to turn your air conditioner off. We aren't, don't believe that realistically we're going to have no new cars th- that you can buy in 2000 in 2030. We have common sense approaches to and that's why our economy continues to grow and people are moving to Texas. And I think that philosophy is where, and as we try to recover out of COVID, would do this next administration well to look at versus the New York, California models. Well said. So I, we, I would be inclined to agree. It's well said. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> you know, we hope that the door stays open because we, yeah. we see partnerships with other countries like Mexico has got its own challenges, but can't our friends in Canada, you know, other countries who see the value in Texas and Texas oil and gas in the United States, you know, we we see that value. Taiwan today is taking um, or it's taken its first 
a shipment of LNG from Chenier that's coming out of out of the United States. These are countries that want to have clean energy. We're using and developing clean energy. People who argue that we don't have clean energy, they haven't looked at the fact that our methane emissions have gone way down in the last 10 years, not because of overregulation, but because industry's seen the value and has put the technologies in place that they need to without being told to versus Russia that, or China that, frankly, don't use any good technology to figure to help their air quality, right? We're doing the right things in this country. And I think that's where, and our flaring's way down, frankly, in the last nine months in this, not, we don't think just because we aren't, we aren't developing, but just because companies are seeing the value in that as well. So I think we're producing a lot of cleaner energy in this country, natural gas being a leader, but oil, we're not, even if you look at projections of any company or any group worldwide that I've seen in the last 10 years, oil and natural gas are going to be part of the energy package for the entire world for the next 50 to 100 years and up to more than 50 percent of the of the energy package for the entire world. It's not going away. So having the ability to have good innovation with common sense rules helps the those that new technology that continues to keep the environment clean get developed. Wonderful. Wow. Well, okay, I see that I've I've taken up nearly all of the time that I've I've asked from you and I I don't want to I know you're a busy lady. So, I guess you've mentioned um plans, you know, for to to be able to get some updated technology so that you can have better data. Flaring is still a top priority even though uh you know, that has been decreasing. Kind of sounds like you're on top of things. Is there anything else that you think is is pertinent or that you'd like to discuss about going into this year? You know, I think the biggest challenge that all states are going to have is how and the federal government, obviously, is how you're going to budget. And so and how we plan for the future. And again, to me, it's knowing oil and gas is going to be there. Knowing energy is important. It's the it people people look at me and say, well, I'm not in the energy industry. Why does it matter? And what I remind people is if they didn't have oil and gas, they wouldn't have a computer. They wouldn't have their iPhone. You wouldn't have all the medical equipment we're using today for COVID and or it's allergy season in Austin, Texas. So you wouldn't have your allergy medicine too. Oil and gas touches you every single day. It's a component of your life, whether you drive or not, it's a component of your life. And so Having good rules and regulations that make sense, I think, is what's going to be important instead of choosing an energy source never works in this country, I found. And so I think if people recognize and continue to have good conversations and make sure that the regulatory body of your state is protecting the environment versus top down from the federal government, it seems to work a lot better. I like that's it. what we hope to see happen. Not hopeful, we hope to see happen. Mm-hmm. And that's where Texas will continue to be a leader in that respect. So come to Texas, but bring your good ideals, not your ultra liberal ones, please. We appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you so much. You are such a wonderful spokeswoman for the industry. You have so much great information. I'm really glad to have gotten the opportunity to talk with you today. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I look forward to visiting again soon. And if anybody's got any questions, please contact us at the Royal Commission. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right, friends and listeners, that was Chairman Christy Craddock with the Texas Railroad Commission. If you like the information, if you'd like to find out more, don't hesitate to get on to rrc.state.tx.us. Or you can also web search Texas Railroad Commission, uh, but they have lots of really great information up on their website. If you would like to know more about Christy Craddock herself, you can certainly go to ChristyCraddock.com. She's got all kinds of wonderful information up there as well as uh, many things that she's been a part of working on in regards to the industry and and so, so much great stuff up there. So by all means, if you have any interest, want to find out more, like I said, go to rrc.state.com. 
www.tx.us, or you can go to christycraddock.com to find out more about Chairman Craddock herself. Loved all the information that she brought with her today. I hope you enjoyed it as well. And if you did, be sure to check out the rest of what thecrudelife.com has to offer.